So thanks very much to uh, Epilepsy Ireland and Future Neuro uh, for inviting me to uh, talk. And uh, we've already heard a, a fantastic talk from uh, Thomas, who's taught us a lot about uh, cannabis, and uh, we've heard Yvonne's uh, incredible story as well. So, so I'm going to talk about uh, medicinal cannabis for epilepsy, the impact, evidence, and uh, future uh, research needs. And I'm going to look at a couple of concepts around medical cannabis that are important for uh, producing effective and safe uh, medicinal cannabis products uh, for epilepsy, and uh, to look at the evidence. Uh, as a disclosure, as Peter said, I was a member of the Medicinal Cannabis uh, Access Program Reference Group as a representative of the Royal College of Physicians. So I'd like to start with looking at two terms that we should know about and we should know what they mean. And, uh, uh, you know, do they mean the same thing or are they different? Uh, cannabis and marijuana. So um, cannabis is the, is the Latin name of the, of the cannabis plant that uh, we don't have time to go into further with Thomas uh, has referred to. And then marijuana is um, a term that's used more in the United States and was actually introduced by a guy called Harry Anslinger over there on the right, who is the commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in the 1930s in the US. And they were clamping down on illegal drugs at the time. And um, they're producing cartoons like this on the right from the 1930s. Um, really discrediting marijuana. You can see it's called the weed from the devil's garden. And uh, they're also trying to associate cannabis and other negative things with Mexican immigrants. So it sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Uh, but these are two terms that are, are not the same. And we need, it's important that we uh, know the difference between these uh, terms, uh, cannabis-based medications and medicinal cannabis products. So, um, and this is confusing even for doctors. So cannabis-based medications are basically pharmaceutical-grade products um, that are um, studied in clinical trials, and they're typically FDA or EMA, European Medical Agency, approved. And these are products like Epidiolex or uh, Sativex or, or Marinol. And then there are medicinal cannabis products, which are mainly um, classed as dietary products. They're um, less regulated, certainly, and kind of of variable quality, unless they are what's called GMP certified. And that's something I will... Uh, refer to in a moment. And as an example of that, and this data on the right here is from a study which looked at cannabis oil samples from Dutch patients, patients who'd brought their cannabis oil in and they looked at what was on the label and then they analyzed what was actually in the oil. And I'm not going to go through each one, but you can see even the first one there, uh, it was 27% CBD on the label. When they tested it, it was actually 2.3%. And the TAC content was 17%. When they tested it, it was 0.1%. So so these are relatively unregulated products, and we just don't know what we're getting in the oil um, uh, with these sort of dietary class products. But uh, does that make a difference? I mean, it's all cannabis, right? It's, it's a, a natural product. It's safe. Um, well, that's not necessarily the case. And uh, I actually borrowed a couple of these slides from my uh, colleague, Warren Davinsky. I worked with him for a couple of years in the US. And... Um, is what's called the naturalistic fallacy. It's been around, a theory that's been around since the early 1900s, where it's natural, so therefore it ought to be safe. Um, but that's generally often not the case. You know, what's natural is often not. It could be very processed. And what's natural may be actually deadly or dangerous. And this is a picture of a fine, um, handsome fellow. I don't know, does anybody know what that is? Right, right. So it's a, it's a Japanese puffer fish. And... Uh, it actually produces a, a toxin, a neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin, which even a tiny amount of it is actually deadly to humans. So, you know, when this um, fish is actually a delicacy in Japan and uh, has to be prepared by a chef who's trained and, you know, high, it's highly regulated uh, product before it's made fit for human consumption. And actually, I just read last week in the news that there was uh, in Japan, that there's a couple of these fish who got sold on the market with their liver still intact, which had the toxin, and there was a big panic, and they had to make a, a public uh, declaration not to eat any puffer fish until they found these fish with the livers in it. So that was just last week. So, um, so what's GMV certified? We want something that is, is going to be safe um, and, and more regulated. Well, this is, this is short for good manufacturing practice. So, uh, so there are cannabis products that are GMP uh, certified, and this means that there is a high uh, a quality assurance in all aspects of production, the premises, the materials, the training and hygiene of the staff, uh, avoiding cross-contamination, standard 
operating procedures and records, they have quality control, it controls also distribution of the product, and there's a system for recall and audit. Um, unfortunately, there's no GMP certified cannabis product available in Ireland or produced in Ireland, um, which, is, which is why we're going abroad, for example, to the, to the Netherlands. And um, as part of the uh, Department of Health Access Programme is currently looking or to procure a GMP certified cannabis product that's reliable for use for patients with epilepsy in Ireland, and that's what's holding up the current process. Another concept uh, about medicinal cannabis and epilepsy is, is called the entourage effect. And, you know, there is, there is a theory that CBD and THC, uh, while they both may be effective for epilepsy, um, that they act synergistically or that cannabis products have to be used together, but they're not effective on their own. Um, and, you know, you can go on the internet and find uh, bits of information like this. A new research confirms what's long been thought. CBD, in addition to other entourage cannabinoids like THC, is far superior medically to pure CBD. And, you know, we just don't know this. You know, in, a, in actual fact, scientific evidence shows that there is no experimental animal data for this, and there's only anecdotal human data. So I just want to illustrate that we just need to be careful about where we get our information, particularly on the internet. Um, in fact, um, you know, there are... Um, uh, there is a concern in the medical community that, you know, partly due to this kind of naturalist views on, on cannabis, uh, that, that it's, it's safe, it's not dangerous, there's no risk to it, you know. Um, and um, this is an article that just came out on the 24th of January last, uh, Dr. Bobby Smythe, and the, and the medical independent, he's a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Ireland. Despite international evidence linking cannabis with schizophrenia and cognitive impairment and our own evidence on escalating cannabis addiction, public opinions of the hazards of cannabis use have softened. So while I think there's enormous potential for cannabis uh, products in epilepsy, we just have to be careful that we're using it in the right way, in the right person, with, for the right condition, and, and in a safe way. Um, there are several states where uh, medical cannabis products or, or medical marijuana uh, is, is legal, all forms, CBD, THC, and, and, and other products. And uh, like the state of Ohio went legal just on January 1st of this year. And um, this is just a statement from the Cleveland Clinic, which is um, ranked the number two hospital in the US overall. And in fact, I spent six years of my training there. And um, they've come out with a statement that they're not recommending medical marijuana. And so why are they saying this? You know, a huge uh, hospital with a massive reputation like this. So they're, they're citing a lack of evidence and FDA approval. They're, they're supporting medications derived from cannabis, but they're, they're sort of flagging a signal that we need to be careful about um, relatively unregulated medical marijuana use for a whole variety of conditions, not just epilepsy. There's dozens and dozens of conditions that it is approved for in many states in the United States. Um, so the Cleveland Clinic has raised a concern. I think, you know, we just have to um, raise a concern with it as well. So this is where we need evidence from clinical studies and... Um, uh, one of my colleagues in the US, Orrin Dubinsky, has been at the forefront of clinical trials for medicinal cannabis. And this is one of the first open-label trials in 2015 uh, using cannabidiol, a 99% CVD preparation in uh, treatment-resistant epilepsy in children. And um, now an open-label trial isn't quite as uh, good in terms of evidence as a randomized control trial, uh, but it's where they've given children with uh, very difficult to control epilepsy uh, CBD in a control way they know it's CBD and they've compared their uh, seizure control over a couple of weeks compared to their baseline and they found that there was a significant reduction in motor seizures 36.5% uh, reduction compared to their baseline and there was significantly greater or um, uh, very good effect in patients at Dravet syndrome as you've heard already it's a very uh, difficult to control severe childhood epilepsy, almost 50% reduction in seizures compared to baseline. And there are a number of other open label trials or reports or series that are um, supporting or signaling that there's a uh, potential benefit for uh, CVD in a number of severe childhood epilepsy syndromes. So this then will uh, allows us to go on and do randomized controlled trials once we have this evidence from open label studies where so we can get the um, support and funding for randomized controlled trials so we can prove that it's effective and um, 
um, these are what's called blinded studies. So they're, 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 we try to remove any bias either for or against a potential effect of CBD in this case uh, for childhood epilepsy. Um, so the clinicians don't know what the patients are getting and the patients don't know what they're getting. It's blinded for a couple of weeks and then at the end of the study it's unblinded and they look back and see well, what, what was the effect of the drug and then it also allows us to be able to tell well, what are the adverse events and, and uh, things we should be concerned about in terms of risks. And um, so Oren had published uh, this trial, a uh, randomized controlled trial of CBD and Gervais syndrome in the, the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017. That's the generally regarded as the, the top medical journal in the world. Um, so only the most rigorous and relevant uh, studies get published. And um, it was a, a study of CBD added to the patient's own medications versus placebo. And there was a significant reduction uh, of almost 40% in the seizures over the course of the trial uh, compared to a placebo reduction of about 12%. Um, there was some um, uh, serious adverse events that we look at later. Um, there's also been a couple of randomized controlled trials in lennox gastaut syndrome, uh, a couple of hundred patients uh, published last year with a, a significant reduction in uh, drop seizures, as you can see there in both trials. So now we have clinical evidence from clinical trials that CBD is effective in Dravet syndrome and uh, lennox gastaut syndrome. And of course, we all want seizure freedom. And um, you know, one important aspect is to look at, well, what's, did any patients actually become seizure free? And based on over 1,000 patients now in both the open label studies and the randomized controlled trials, about 8 to 8.5% 8 of patients became seizure free over the duration of the study, typically about 12 weeks. Unfortunately, we don't have any really long-term data from these trials uh, at this point. So um, while there are you know, very dramatic responses, um, you know, it's the exception rather than the rule, but it's fantastic when we get that. Uh, like I said, these trials allow us to look in an unbiased way at potential for adverse events. And in the randomized clinical control trials, the main side effects were somnolence, sedation, decreased appetite and diarrhea, uh, elevations in liver function tests, and the withdrawal rate was about 9.3% versus 1.3% in placebo. Uh, the risk factors identified for liver function test abnormalities. They're more common in patients who are also on valparate. Uh, they're associated with a higher dose of CBD and uh, where a baseline elevated liver function tests are abnormal. So, so it just shows that you know, we can't really use it in an unregulated way. We need to use it in a supervised way. These are complex patients on multiple medications and we need to uh, be aware of all these potential adverse events and, in and interactions. Um, there was a number of important drug-drug uh, interactions identified, so, so CBD and THC can inhibit uh, liver enzymes that can affect the concentrations of other medications, including other anti-epileptic medications, uh, warfarin, chemotherapeutic agents, psychiatric medications, and also there can be other drugs affect CBD's metabolism as well, such as other anti-epileptic drugs and even antibiotics. So, we need to be aware of this and, and manage this in a supervised way under medical supervision so that uh, we can be both keep an eye out for these potential interactions and manage them when they occur. Um, there have been a number, number of other trials uh, that are either completed or ongoing uh, for uh, medicinal cannabis products, both in epilepsy and other disorders. There's a couple of trials in focal epilepsy, but unfortunately it looks like the, those trials are turning out to be negative, so at the, this point in time, we're not recommending <coughs> medicinal cannabis products or CBD for focal epilepsy uh, based on, on clinical studies. Um, there's been a number of studies looking at anxiety and behavior in Fragile X, and then more recently, actually, there's been a couple of positive uh, studies looking at uh, behavior in autism uh, benefiting from CBD, and there's a couple of conflicting trials in, in schizophrenia. <coughs> So we've, we've come, it's fantastic that we've come a long way in coming, uh, in medical terms anyway, in just a couple of brief years from you know, the plant to actually having medical products, uh, medicinal products and medications that are cannabis-based uh, for the treatment of patients with epilepsy. But um, I would just stress again that we just need to be careful and uh, I would, uh, promote research because that's what teaches us about what's effective and what the risks are and what to watch out for. And I encourage everyone uh, who can get involved in research to be involved 
um, either from a supportive point of view or, or from being enrolled in, 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 in clinical trials, uh, we need to know more. And we need to have trials in THC. Uh, we need to, uh, as uh, Yvonne mentioned, it's, it's difficult uh, to get these trials off the ground. Uh, but we need more evidence. We need more research. We need more, more trials. Uh, we're very optimistic that there's a great future in, uh, for medicinal cannabis products in epilepsy. Um, just to summarize, we have, we have good uh, scientific evidence that CBD and THC are effective in animal models. Uh, we know now that CBD is effective based on randomized controlled trials in Dervais syndrome and lennox gastaut syndrome. And we now have an, there is now an FDA-approved CBD product uh, uh, for those specific epilepsy syndromes. Um, the initial data doesn't unfortunately support uh, CBD or, or also CBD-V, cannabidovarin, in focal epilepsy. But again, more studies are needed, I would encourage research in this area. Thank you.